Hey, hey everyone. Um, welcome to back to the talks. Um, there are a lot of people in here. Wow. Um, thanks for uh, coming to my talk. I'm gonna. My name is Daisy Holman. I'm from Google. Um, and wow, that was that was not very carefully typed my password on screen so that no one sees it. Yeah, excellent. Um, anyway, uh, that was fun. Uh, if you're in the back, uh, you, there's going to be a, a lot of code in this slide, uh, on these slides. Um, uh, mostly big enough font, but some of it might not be. So either you may want to come up to this upper front section or pull up the slides on your laptop and you should be able to look through them on your laptop. They're at dsh.fyi slash cppcon-2022. So um, feel free to pull those up, dig through them, um, follow along. Uh, yeah, let's see if, if this still works. All right, it does, awesome. All right, uh, so goals for this talk. Uh, I gave this talk last year. I was kind of shocked at how much people liked it, um, but super delighted because I, I really enjoyed giving these talks. It's really just, we're gonna hang out and geek out about how weird C++ is and maybe learn something along the way, hopefully. But uh, yeah, um, sometimes you have to laugh to keep from crying and it's, it's been a long week, so let's, let's, let's hang out and um, maybe learn something along the way. But yeah, definitely I think that playing with C++ is, is a great way to learn new things about how C++ works. Um, one of the points of these like cute trick talks and tweets and stuff that I do is all about showing something so bizarre that it'll like stick in your mind when you actually see the, the analogous situation in real code. And actually in this talk, I will talk about the right way to do this if you, act, if you come across it. Although I think the, the one trick that I assume that I'll get to in this talk probably is not a thing you should be doing, and I'll explain wh that, why that is too. Um, but uh, the, the thing that I really want people to come away with is how to learn these things, right? How to, how to pull up a Godbolt uh, window and play around with you know, little nuances of the language and try and understand how things work. Um, I have a confession to make here. Um, this isn't the talk I promised to give. I know a bunch of you, um, have talked to me this week and been like, what are you gonna talk about? Which, which trick are you gonna be talking about? And uh, yeah, I said something. Um, this is the talk I promised to give in, like when I submitted my talk, don't get me wrong. It, but for, throughout this week, I've been putting together this talk and um, it was on this cute trick, which um, if you don't understand it, that's great because that's why I decided not to give a talk on it. Um, but I did want to flash it up on the screen for the people who actually came here to see this because I, I think there's several people I promised I'd talk about this. This, this talk had like everything. There's all kinds of cool things I could dive into. There's my, my favorite class template in all of C++. Does anyone have a favorite, anyone else have a favorite class template? This is mine. This is the entire implementation too. Um, definition, declaration, implementation, everything. Um, it has this like call out to like why does everyone use uh, tuple element T when you could use variant alternative T for exactly the same thing? Um, it has this uh, partial specialization, which I am gonna actually talk about in this talk. It has these two different uses of the type identity, and I was gonna go into how like this type identity is this super simple feature, but it took like a seven page paper and an enormous amount of time just to get that into the standard, and then I was gonna thank Teamer for doing so much good work to do that. Um, it had two immediately invoked lambdas, so immediately invoked lambda fans would have been excited about this, and they're, they're like the, the super special kind of immediately invoked lambdas that come in between angle brackets. Those are really special. Um, it had class template argument deduction that was actually saving an enormous number of characters. Uh, it had expanding parameter packs over two different expansions with nested expansion, and I was going to walk through how that works, and then this is the crux of the trick. If you were looking at this trick online when I posted it about how to use std sort to actually sort a type list, 
Um, this is, and, and, and that's the kind of thing that like rung a bell with you. This is probably the part that was missing in your mind when you, when you first thought about it. Um, you, you, I make like a variant of all of the types and then like um, make an array of variants of all the possibilities and then just visit them with the user's key. And that gives us our comparison function to do, to do the sort and then we just take the sorted indices and put them back into the type list. So that's, that's the talk that I was gonna do. If that sounds horrific, then I made a really good decision in not doing that talk. If uh, you're really excited about that, I'm sorry. Um, I will maybe give that talk at a different conference, but the, it was too esoteric and I wanted to try and do something a little more practical. Um, so disclaimers, um, I probably only gonna get, get to one trick this talk. I have um, several backup slides if we have time, but uh, don't use this trick in real code, but do use this to like learn things that will help you understand existing code and learn things that will help you express things in code that you write that may be more readable for one reason or another as long as it's clearly explained. Um, this is not a software engineering talk. Specifically, well-written code should be unsurprising, right? This is kind of the anti-software engineering talk or the opposite of software engineering talk. Because this is a talk about code that is surprising, right? People are like, oh, that's cool, retweet. Um, and that's like the, the point of this, right? Um, I will talk about how to do the same thing in a less surprising way. And, and less surprising should generally be short for better when you're writing real code. Um, and I'll talk about why not to do it in the first place. Um, I've had throughout my life this problem of getting too into the weeds in the talk and I just, in talks, and I just decided to start leaning into it. So this talk is all weeds. Um, so I hope that's okay with you. I assume that's part of why you came to this conference. Uh, anyway, here we go. Um, so the cute trick I wanna talk about today is how can you partially specialize a concept? So C++ 20 doesn't allow you to do concept partial specialization. But the, the trick that I'm gonna show is that you can, um, you can get a similar effect by using explicit template parameters with a lambda um, and a requires clause on that lambda. So I'm gonna walk through what all of that means. Um, and uh, so if you didn't follow that slide from that little quick flashed up thing, um, that's totally fine. So let's, let's start by talking about concepts. Concepts are awesome, they're in C++20. Who's actually gotten to write a concept in like real production code? Oh my gosh, I wanna work with all of you. Um, who's written a concept in like fun, hanging out, geeking out with friends code? Okay, that's, that's mostly me. I'm, I mean, I've written some in like things that we sent to the committee, but not in real code. Um, yeah, and who, who doesn't know what concepts are? Wow, there's like a few people in here, so hopefully you'll understand um, by the end of this talk uh, much better, but I think there's probably quite a bit to learn about how concepts work that many people who have actually used them may not know. So concepts are this compact way of constraining template parameters to have certain properties, right? So we're, we're saying that this, this um, expression here, right, has to be a valid substitution of the template parameter, right? I, I, uh, I hear a lot of people say, oh, this, is, this has to compile, being the, the thing that people say, and that's, that's not really quite right, because it, it, it has to parse whether or not it's a, a um, valid substitution. But what, what concepts are really checking is whether it's a valid substitution of the template parameter, right? Um, and so, in this example, we can, create an overload set called hello add. One of them takes an unconstrained template parameter and one of them takes a um, addable, right? And if we call it with 42, we get hello. Uh, if we call it with like a std vector of an int, we get goodbye. Um, that is hopefully what you would expect from like looking at this code, right? From the like five minute explanation of what concepts are and then the use of them, hopefully that's what you would expect. Um, so there's several notations of, um, for Audible because as 
the C++ community, we really don't like to make things that you can do just one way. So, you know, that was, that was a joke, actually. Like, maybe we should. Um, but there's, there's at least three ways to do this. Um, and they're all different notations. I'm actually going to stick with one. Um, these, these three, this, this, and this up here all mean the same thing. I'm going to stick with this one. Uh, here, it's the most verbose, but uh, it'll be clear why I've stuck with it at the end of the talk. Um, but just know that all three of these things are equivalent. Figure out what people in your code base are using and use the one that matches the way they're doing it. Um, don't do things that are different from the code that you're modifying. That's generally a good practice, right? Um, but this is the, the kind of the most explicit way to write this, right? The most verbose, the most explicit, but you can do a lot more things with it. Um, quick review, partial specialization. Who feels like they fully understand partial specialization? Fully, okay. Uh, there are few liars in the crowd and a lot of honest people. <laughs> I know specifically Christian is lying because we've had this conversation before. <laughs> anyway, um, Partial specialization, I barely understand it fully, I think. I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't say fully, I would say like most of it. I understand it well enough to give a talk here, but let's talk about what partial specialization is and, and how it's changed with the addition of concepts. So you can specialize a template by giving explicit types for its parameters, right? Um, this is like, this is what we call full specialization, and it's different from partial specialization. And when you, when you see this like open, close, angle bracket next to each other, you, that's your key that you're doing a full specialization, right? Um, and this works like you'd expect, right? You have a version that is for any type of T and you have a version that's specifically for int, right? Um, and this, they each have this, this you know, print function. And um, so you can partially specialize a template by giving more specific values for some or all of the parameters but still depending on at least one parameter, right? So you're not gonna have this empty open close bracket, um, but you're not gonna have exactly the same thing as the, uh, the primary template uh, declaration, right? So you, you have something that's kind of, intuitively speaking at least, more specialized. And we're gonna talk about what more specialized means in a second. Um, Partial specializations don't have to specialize much, right? You could just, you can, you can literally just have this, this be, specifically be a ref, right? Um, and this will work like you'd expect. Um, concepts can be used as part of partial specialization, right? So even though we have exactly the same, like token for token character sequence here as we have in the template parameter, because we've constrained it with a concept, this is a partial specialization, right? And so that's, that's new in C++20 uh, that we, we have that uh, difference. And so this, this will look kind of weird, right? Um, this is like, looks like you did something wrong, but we should get used to the idea that uh, requires clauses introduce partial specializations. Uh, a cute mini trick for everyone who knew everything in these slides so far and um, is excited to be surprised. Um, as long as none of the other partial specializations are concept constrained, you can shadow the unspecialized implementation uh, using a trivial requires clause. Um, don't do this, but I am fairly sure someone's going to do this for some reason. Um, you can add a requires true to the unspecialized template, and um, you get, uh, you've completely shadowed the original template. This code now does effectively nothing. Um, so if you wanted to like completely replace the primary template definition of std vector, you could in theory do that. Um, it's probably undefined behavior. It's almost certainly undefined behavior or ill-formed or whatever, but in theory, you could do that. Um, that is, uh, the, the moment you try and introduce a different constraint though, right, uh, now you have an ambiguity because um, t, because int is an equally good match for std integral 
and for true. Um, and I'm gonna go into why that is for a second, but there is actually a workaround for that. If you really, really wanna do this, um, if you introduce a named concept and use subsumption, um, then, or if you have other types of constraints, then, then this will still work. So if we introduce this, this, this named concept true instead of using the literal true, right? And I have a God bolt for this if you wanna play around with it because there's lots of things, rabbit holes you can go down on this. And then this is like basically the same thing we did uh, on the last slide, right? By the way, you don't actually need a template parameter here, um, but Clang is broken if you don't have one um, in this example, so I, I put it there. But uh, GCC works fine, MSVC works fine. Good job, compiler implementers. Clang, I'll be filing a bug. Um, or someone can file a bug, I already tweeted about it. Um, and, and so we, we do this, uh, stood as integral and true here, right? And now this works, right? Because this is more specialized than this. And intuitively, I think that's what we all expect, right? It's just that the previous slide is only slightly different from this and is unintuitively what we, not what we expect, right? And so you have to have named concepts to do this. Um, but, but this works. You, this is more specialized. This, this third definition is more specialized than the second one, right? And we can still also do things like this, right? We can have a reference here, and this is more specialized than the true, right? And so this will, will also work. Um, so this, this ordering gets a little bit more complicated when you start mixing kind of the partial specialization ordering with uh, patterns like this and partial specialization ordering with requires clauses, especially when some of those requires clauses have subsumption. But for the most part, it should work like you expect with named concepts. When you start introducing unnamed concepts, subsumption gets weird, right? Um, so, you know, we had to make some decisions in C++ uh, 20 to make concepts like implementable. Um, this is one of the weird ones. Um, I'm gonna get into more about subsumption in a second, but um, I wanna talk about what it means to be more specialized. Um, so if we have three um, definitions here, two partial specializations and one primary template definition, um, what would you expect this to print? Go ahead and shout it out. B, right, and that's exactly what it does, right? Um, and what would this print? Exactly, right? So, I mean, the goal of designing language features like this is for people to be able to guess, right? Like, to some extent, things should do what, what you guess they do. We couldn't really do this with subsumption, but this, is, this was like kind of the goal, right? Is, is like, intuitively, if I have this like three partial specializations, one's constrained on, or three definitions, two partial specializations and a primary definition, One's constrained on integral and one's constrained on signed integral. What will we expect this to print? C, right? It does. What will we expect this to print? It prints B, yeah. So this is exactly what you'd expect. And for library, standard library concepts, we've, we've done this correctly, right? But what does more specific specifically mean in the context of subsumption, right? So here's an example. If we're just at writing our own concepts, right? We have this basic addable and um, we want to like kind of make it more specific by constraining the, the type that the expression returns, right? So this is how you constrain the return type of an expression in a requires clause. Um, you can, uh, I, it's, not a, it's not called a requires clause, but someone will correct me what this is called. Um, inside the, the curly brace thingies uh, after the word requires. Um, so you, can, you do this arrow and then you say the, the type of the expression has to match this concept, right? Um, and so this is like, if we look at this concept and we look at this concept, right? This one is, is, is more specialized, right? It, it's, it's requiring exactly the same thing, but more, right? But it turns out it's really hard for a compiler to figure out what exactly the same thing, but more means, unless we say so specifically. So does anyone know what this prints? 
Trick question, it doesn't compile, exactly. It's ambiguous, right? So it's ambiguous because it matches both of these concepts, and the compiler has no way to figure out that these concepts are related to each other. I believe at one point there was a version of concepts that was gonna try and do that for you, um, and that turned out to be a bad idea. Um, so you have to be explicit about it. So, so subsumption must be explicit, it must use name concepts. So if we have basic addable and we say that we require basic addable and this, right? So it's like, we're saying almost the same thing, right? Because basic addable is in here. We're not really saying anything more to the reader, but we are saying something more to the compiler. And, and maybe to some extent to the reader in that we're saying we intended for these things to be related, but like the names kind of say that we intended for them to be related, so. But this is something that tells the compiler that these two things are related by subsumption. Now if we do exactly the same thing, right, what does this print? It prints C, right, yeah, and that's what we'd expect, right? It's just that we have to be careful with how we define our own concepts. And that's why the signed integral and integral version works, right? Because signed integral is defined to subsume integral, right? Um, so let's talk about function template partial specialization. This is kind of a soapbox on compiler warnings because I've seen so many code bases get this wrong just because the compiler warning was wrong. Um, so the, the error message that I, that I see, I think it's still in most compilers and I would really like it if, if they would like suggest a fix it that is along the lines of these slides. So I see like function template partial specialization is not allowed. Right, so if I have this, this template buzz, right, um, this function template, right, and I wanna like partially specialize it for L value references, right? You can't do that, that doesn't compile, right? And it won't, it won't compile and it'll say function template partial specialization is not allowed. And so people are like, oh, okay, I guess I have to do class template partial specialization for this. No, this, this, this will work fine if you just remove four characters from that, right? If you just remove four characters and do an overload, right? So Function template overload loading is very similar to partial specialization in many ways, right? Um, there are probably some key ways that, that they're different. I couldn't think of any while I was writing this slide. I'm sure somebody will write some really interesting ones in the YouTube comments, so I'm looking forward to reading those. Um, but yeah, if we do this, we, we get it printing C, like we'd expect, right? And, and what I'd really like to see in, in compiler error messages is like, uh, function template partial specialization is not allowed. Did you mean to just write an overload? Um, because so many times I see people see that and then they like, oh, okay, I have to redirect to like an implementation detail partial specialization of a class and then call the like call operator of that. And then your overload sets get extremely complicated. Your error messages get ugly because you're getting an error mas message in some sort of implementation namespace. And just don't do it. Like just use overloads there are like probably, they probably are some like legitimate use cases that people think should work for um, partial uh, function template partial specialization. But 99.9% .9 of the time I've seen this in production code, the person should have just been using overload sets. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, let's, let's look at how subsumption interacts with um, overloads, right? So this is, this is exactly the same concept we had before where we actually explicitly said these two are related to each other. If we have these three overloads, very similar to how we had three partial specializations before, what would we expect this to print? Shout it out, anyone? C, all right, awesome. So yeah, this, this subsumption works the same way, right? And this is why, this is, to some extent why you can't do both partial specialization and overloading with function templates, right? Because they kind of accomplish the same role, they kind of work the same way, and if we allowed both of them, we'd have to figure out like which one was more important. And that's just not something we, not a road we wanted to go down and it doesn't really add that much, it adds an enormous amount of complexity um, to the compiler without really adding all that much functionality. All right, so let's get to the, um, challenges, and we, we, we still haven't gotten to anything that's like cute, right? This is all just normal C++, hopefully. Um, well, we did do one cute thing with the requires true, don't do that. Um, so let's, let's, let's look at this challenge. Um, 
This is, by the way, like how I learn to play with C++ these days. Like I'll be, I'll wake up in the morning and be like, hmm, I wonder if I can sort a type list with std sort or hmm, I wonder if I can do like the one that I'm working on right now in my brain is like, I wonder if I can do a type list sort using only deduction guides. Um, like things like that, that challenge myself to explore features of um, C++. So here's, here's an interesting one. Like, can we write a, a class template with a single template parameter and a member function print that prints odd if the class template's parameter is itself a template with an odd number of template arguments and nope otherwise, right? So here's examples of how this would work, right? If, if this odd detector is given like example with int float char, that should print odd. But if it's given example with int and float, that should print nope, right? Um, if it's given std complex, um, it prints odd. If it's given int, which is like not a template at all, it prints nope, okay? So if you're watching on YouTube and you're like playing along, you wanna pause the video and give it a try, um, that might be fun. If not, cool also. Um, I'm gonna talk about the answer here. Uh, by the way, does anyone have a guess as to why I st chose to complex here? Anyone? Like, why didn't I choose std vector here? Vector has two, but, it, but I said std vector of int. How, how can it have two, Marshall? Default template parameters, right. So I didn't want to confuse the situation. I found, I thought std complex was the probably most common um, template in the standard library that has an odd number and no defaults. Um, another candidate was std future. Um, if you have other candidates, like, yeah, tweet them at me. I think that would have been be interesting to discuss. But there are a surprising number of defaulted template arguments or template parameters in the standard library. Um, so here's a possible answer for this, right? We haven't even gotten into, like, partial specializing concepts, right? But we just talked about how to partially specialize, um, how, to, how to partially specialize class templates, right? So we can have a primary template that looks like this and just prints nope, right? So now we have to write a partial specialization that only matches the case that we want for odd. And this is what it's gonna look like, right? We're gonna deduce a, a template template here, right? We're gonna deduce a parameter pack of arguments, right? Um, I think I specifically said in the challenge, if I didn't say it in the challenge, don't worry about non-type template parameters in this challenge. Hopefully you didn't like pause the video and then like go get stuck on non-type template parameters and then come back and be like, this is so frustrating. Why did you give me an impossible challenge? Um, sorry. Um, you, can, you can tweet at me and I'll like tweet sorry back. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, and, and we have a requires clause, right? So we, we're, we're, we're mixing, we have this, this matching of a pattern and we have this requires clause. And this is, there's, this is demonstrating a lot of really important things here, right? It's demonstrating that like partial uh, specialization is really this form of like giving a pattern and then getting names out of that pattern, right? So we, we give this pattern where we have like something that is a template and that's, this is how we say, tell me about something that's a template and give it the name TMPL, right? And we have something that is a parameter pack of arguments, right? And, and this is how we say, give me something that is, that matches zero or more type arguments and uh, to this template and name that pack of things args, right? And so now that we have a name for this pack, we can do size of dot, dot, dot on it. Take mod two equals one, right? That's like definition of odd, right? Um, well, maybe. Um, good enough definition of odd uh, for this purpose. And uh, this gives us our solution, right? Does this make sense? Is everyone mostly following this? Okay. Um, let's, oh, wow, I have 28. I might get to a second trick here. This might be fun. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, so challenge 1B. So I'm not going to go through this in nearly as much detail, right? Because it's exactly the same thing. So if you, um, if you paused for the first one and tried it and didn't get it, 
See if you can get this one now that I've explained it. So here's the examples of the same thing, right? We have a function uh, overload set that we're trying to make, and we want to do exactly the same thing as we did with partial specialization. And the punchline, the reason why I'm calling this challenge 1B is that it's exactly the same, essentially, right? Um, we're writing out uh, a partial specialization, not a partial specialization, sorry, a different overload that looks exactly like the partial specialization from our previous slide, right? And we're matching and getting names for things in the same way. We're constraining with the requires clause. This looks very similar, right? And that's on purpose, right? C++ is designed to let you reuse things in your brain to do different things. Um, and sometimes we're really bad at that, but sometimes we do a good job. And I think this is a place where we did a good job, because this is an incredibly complicated thing to have to learn twice. But if you can use basically the same information for two different things, then it, it's actually a little bit more surmountable. Um, all right, so challenge number two, right? Um, write a concept that constrains types to be templates with an odd number of template parameters, right? So like the first thing everyone wants to do, and like, one of the first things I tried when I got a hold of concepts um, back in like 2017 or something like that, um, because like committee people get things early. Um, that's not actually true, but um, we play with things way earlier than we should probably. Um, we can't use uh, partial specialization directly for this. One of the first things I tried to do was to, to partially specialize a concept and say like, oh, well, how, how's this gonna work? It turns out like implementing concepts is, is more or less too hard if we allow this. It gets to be very tricky, particularly when you start to involve subsumption, right? Um, so we would like to have, um, we could use template class template partial specialization directly, right? We can use basically the same solution that we had from challenge number one um, to do this, right? We can, we can create, but instead of like printing something out in here, we just give this data, this um, um, non-type static member, that is not at all the right word, so I'm just not even gonna try and use the right word here. We give value here and um, set it to false for one and true for the other. We could inherit from std true type and std false type. That would be a little bit more idiomatic. Um, and then this, this just works, right? This is like probably the least surprising way to do this, right? Because we can't do partial specialization with concepts, but we can do partial specialization with something similar. So if you really, really have to do this, which I really think you don't, but if you do, then you should do something like this, right? you should use the least surprising version of this. But there's a cuter answer to this. We can just use uh, our answer to, to challenge 1B, right? We can just use a, fun make a function definition, have no function definition, no overload that matches the version that's not this, right? And then have a requires clause that says this has to be a valid substitution. And that works the same way but we can get cuter. And this is the trick that I posted to Twitter, essentially. The cutest answer to this is to take that, take that function template right over here. Sorry, this is small, but I'm just trying to carry it over from the previous slide. We, we can take that function template that we had and just define it in line with the lambda, right? And you see how this works. This looks almost exactly the same, except for now we're using a lambda. In C++20, we can do this thing with um, explicit temp template parameters to lambdas that let us get names for things and do the same kind of pattern matching that we have in the argument list, right? And we can stick a requires clause in the lambda, right? And that um, is the trick, more or less. And it, it, it's surprising and cute, and you probably shouldn't do it. You probably should do the first version of this, but that is a cute answer for this. There's a general pattern to this. I'm gonna skip over this really quickly because I actually kind of want to get to another uh, slide and I, maybe I'll ask people what they're more excited about or something because I have 24 minutes left. Um, this is really cool. I'm so glad I've never had extra time on one of these talks. Um, so yeah, this is the general pattern more or less. You can make it a more general pattern to have more partial specializations by joining these things with an or. Can anyone see why this is different from normal partial specialization? What makes this pattern different from normal partial specialization? What happens if I have an ambiguity? This still works fine in the presence of an ambiguity. So if you really, really wanted something that's exactly the same as partial specialization, 
four multiple options, you could build an overload set using this like overloads trick that's been in several other talks, and then constrain your, your concept on that overload being valid to call, right? And that, now you have essentially like tied things together, right? You've, you've, this, is, this works because partial specialization is so similar to function overload resolution, right? Um, but let's talk about why you should basically never use this pattern, right? Um, so like you're coming into this saying, I want a concept for a vector of things that work with the plus operator, right? Like I want a vector of addable things, right? And so you like watch this top talk up to this point and then stop the YouTube video because you like, I don't know, had to go get lunch. And you're like, I know how to do this now. I'm gonna stick this in here. And great, your code works. Um, do you really want this though? Like this is the first question I would ask is like, why do you want this? Like, why are you writing code that's so specific that you know that the container type is exactly vector? And by the way, exactly vector with stood allocator, right? But so generic that all you know about the member type is that it is, uh, the element type is that it's addable. That just doesn't seem like a library you should be writing, right? Think about how generic you need to be and how specific you need to be in most cases. And I'm sure there are legitimate use cases. I'm sure I'll get like loads of links to them in tweets and in messages and in Discord. But in general, I think that like if you're asking yourself to do this, you maybe need to ask yourself why. Um, if you do actually need to do this, there's better ways to do it than what I showed, right? You don't wanna write a concept that necessarily constrains the, the template parameter like that. You could do it a couple of ways, right? You could just constrain the template parameter at the uh, declaration site, right? At the function declaration site. We can pattern match on, on, on this thing, right? To get the template parameter out and then just constrain the, that directly. Um, and that works and that's a lot more intuitive than everything I showed in these slides so far. Or if we wanna be generic over the container, which is probably the, the correct answer in the context of a generic library that actually needs to do this, um, we can constrain on the value type of the container, right? We can constrain on the fact that this expression has to be a valid substitution. Um, I, and again, you probably, uh, you also probably shouldn't be writing inline requires clauses like this if you're writing a library that's like exposing overloads that are sensitive to concepts. Um, this is essentially, uh, there's a lot of reasons, there's a lot of other talks about why it's it, where, why a inline requires clause is potentially a code smell and maybe you should think about something different. And I hate the word code smell, so I'm not gonna say that more because it's like a way that people use to say that they're right. But um, that's another discussion. Anyway, uh, the, the point here is that uh, there, is, there are other ways to do this. Um, maybe think about why you're asking for this. Oh wow, thanks, okay. Um, let's look at what else I have for tricks here. So I have this, this type list sort, which I think is an entire um, hour long talk. We have this jumping over unreachable code trick. Um, I haven't presented that one in a while, but we can jump into that one. Um, I have using operator square bracket with tuples. Um, and I have assertions and constants per context. So let me narrow it down to the last three. Who's most excited about one? All right, a couple. Who's most excited about square bracket operator with tuple? To, okay, that's a lot. Who's most excited about assertions and constants per contexts? A few. All right, let's, let's do operator square bracket with tuple. This is, this is definitely much more along the lines of the usual cute trick stuff. All right, so um, there's a link to the tweet. Um, I haven't looked over this before this talk, by the way, so if there's something weird in here, I'm sorry. Um, I stuck it in as bonus slides, but here's basically how you do this, right? And uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna walk through it, but let's take a step back uh, into C++ literals, right? What, what are literals in C++, right? Um, like we have integer literals, we have floating point literals, we have string literals. It's pretty actually, actually pretty easy to list out all of the different types of literals, right? There's Boolean literals, there's technically one more literal called the pointer literal, which is literally the character's null pointer. Um, and, and like, these can have a lot of variability to them, right? Integer literals can be all kinds of weird. Um, floating point literals, like, 
Who's written a hexadecimal floating point literal in real code? Of course, Marshall. Um, awesome, like three people. Um, I do not want to work with you. <laughs> that sounds horrifying. Um, okay, test, oh right, these are standard library, uh, never mind. Compiler implementers, awesome. Um, also, maybe that's like not a great sign when the only people who have written something are compiler implementers, but maybe a different discussion. Um, and, and string literals, there's some like really cute things you can do with string literals, right? You can like have these custom delimiters. Um, if you haven't seen this before, this is, this is actually pretty cool. Um, but uh, C++ actually provides a way for us to do something like to build our own literals, right? We can, um, literals are PR value expressions with a type determined from compiler based, from the compiler based on the value and, and syntax. Suffixes can be used to change that, right? So we, we have these, these suffixes that are provided by the standard. Um, we have a new one in 23, um, the, it's Z. Um, and yeah, um, yes. You, unsigned size and signed size. Um, and that's the entire new feature. It was also in uh, Timur's talk. So Timur actually like gave a talk about five new features. Um, so we can also do these, these user-defined literals, right? If I want to have a distance type that um, has a double in meters and I, or in, yes, in meters, and I have like this kilometer um, suffix, right? Then I can, I can have this uh, user-defined literal operator that gives us an instantiation of a distance object, right? The standard library actually has some, so the, the rule is with, with um, user-defined suffixes that you have to use an underscore in between there, right? And the, 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 the ones that don't have an underscore are, um, are reserved for the standard library um, in this namespace stood literals, which I actually think was a really good decision here. Um, I think code would be pretty unreadable if you didn't know that something weird was going on by seeing that underscore. Um, even if it is like annoying for people who wanna write um, EDSLs, I believe that is ill-formed to, somebody's gonna say ill-formed Ill diagnostic required or to, to not give an underscore or just recommend it against. It's gonna break. Okay, awesome. That's, uh, that's, that, that's like a really good decision that we made I think there. Um, so we also have these things called user-defined literal templates. Um, and since C++11 actually, you've been able to define a user-defined literal template like this, right? That gets these, um, it has no arguments, right? No runtime arguments, which is kind of looks weird already, right? And it has these characters deduced in the template parameter and um, who has actually written one of these in real code? Like real production code that you used at your, at your wow, that's awesome. I, I wanna hear a lightning talk about this from Ben. Sounds like Ben Dean would have a good story on this. Um, he's in the front row, raised his hand, so. Um, this is the, the most legitimate use case I can think of for this. There's no real way to give like gigantic literals that don't fit into, um, that don't necessarily fit into native types. And so you actually can go through, this is not a production implementation of this, don't, don't try and like build up types this way, but um, you, can, you, get, you actually get the characters, the literal characters that the user put into the code as your template parameters when the user gives this suffix. And that's like really weird for people to see, right? Because we don't really think of being able to get like something parsed from the, from the source code into a template parameter that we can actually use. And, and, and this is like what it, likes, what it looks like to have like real metaprogramming and real generative reflection. Like um, you just get these kinds of things that the user wrote and you can do things with them. Um, so I really hope we get like more powerful reflection, uh, more powerful generative metaprogramming sooner rather than later. I know I'm like the thousandth person to say that even at this conference, but um, yeah. So this is, this is a feature we've had since C++11, which I think surprises a lot of people. 
um, and has a lot of really niche use cases. Um, but we can return anything from the template. It doesn't have to be like, in this case, we're like returning a boost multi-precision, right? But we could actually return something that looks like this, right? It's a type that has this, like, the, the, the number that the user gave in a template parameter. Uh, we could have just used std integral constant. Um, it's a little less cute. That's why I didn't do it. Um, and, and then we can write this, this uh, user-defined literal suffix, underscore i, for instance. Um, and then, like, you know, some, like, a to i function that is better than what I wrote on the previous slide, but is, is you know, could be similar. And, and we actually can call that function. We can um, get the, the a, a new instance of this index type, right? And now we have a thing that we can, that we can resolve at compile time and have our return type be dependent on this number, right? So that when I, when I um, do this kind of thing here, right, uh, with this square bracket, we have this like really surprising and clean looking code that um, takes, like we do have to do this literal suffix, but beyond that, we, we're just taking a number here and like indexing into a uh, tuple with a number there, right? Um, so I thought that was um, pretty cute. Um, I guess I'll go back to the original definition. I was much worse at writing cute trick slides when I wrote this before. But like we can inherit from tuple to insert this in, right? Um, and that's, that's more or less the end of that trick. I have 10 minutes left, wow. Um, does anyone have any questions or didn't follow that at all? Like, I'll take a few questions. Yeah, come on up to the mics, and I'll take a few questions. And if I have time for something else, I'll jump into another trick or something. But um, I just have a question about the technique in general. Is it possible to create some kind of uh, const text per parameters? Because in fact, that you know, you are passing a const x per value. Yeah, is it possible? you know, to generalize it and create a function that accepts const x per parameter? Yes, look at my Twitter. It's the last thing I just tweeted, actually. Um, there's, yeah, basically you just take a, a template that, and especially in C++20 this is easier, right? Because you can have a, a template, just name it const x per param, that takes a non-type template parameter of deduced type, so auto, right? And then, um, and you use it that way, and like uh, even have like this wrapper that's like const x per arg, but you have to have something at both the call site and at the function site, right? You can't like transparently um, have the user figure out later that their thing happened at const eval, like as a const eval. Um, and that, for better or worse, is the way things are. Like C++ is already really, really hard to compile. If we had like transparent const x per parameters, C++ would be way harder to compile perhaps impossible, according to some people. Um, so, like, um, yeah, you can, you can generalize this, but it is gonna be the same problem as here. You're going to have to have something at the call site that the user can tell, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing, right? Maybe the user should know that they're passing in something that is a const x per parameter. Um, yeah. Was the suggestion to use this or not use this? Because oh, this don't seems use really- this. No, this is, no. I mean, okay, so there's a lot of things that don't really work intuitively about this, right? Like, one of them is that, like, this only works with literals, right? If you now try and write a for loop and, like, put a, a, a runtime variable into those square brackets, right, you no longer have this literal, right? So, like, this looks really cute, but then, like, people are just immediately going to try and do things that are intuitive extensions to this, and they're going to get different behavior that they're, they're surprised by, right? And so... Like, there are too many ways in which this is surprising for you to do this. I will say that if you want to implement a named tuple, so I have a, a, a tweet that's pretty similar to this that, where I implement a named tuple like this. And I, I will say this is not far from what you might want to do for a named tuple. You're probably going to want to use literal suffixes for that. And um, that, that might be closer to what you want to do. You, you may want to ask the question, why are you writing, why are you writing a named tuple? There are valid reasons for doing that, but uh, it's not very C++. -y. Maybe you like Python more and maybe you should just be writing Python. I know I'd be writing Python if I could, if it was fast enough. Um, but yeah, 
uh, the suggestion is don't do this because there's too many sharp edges, too many uh, weird corners around this. It's just too cute. And everyone knows what stdget does. People don't necessarily know what this does. Hey, Ben. Hey, I have a question about your, um, the concept trick. Yeah. Um, is the concept considered a, a, a non-evaluating context? In other words, ah, could, could you skip yes. the requires and just call the, immediately invoke the lambda with decalval? I forgot to talk about this. Um, thank you for reminding me. This is actually, let's see if I can go all the way down. I don't know where the best place to show this is. Um, maybe in the cute trick itself. Uh, so the thing with this trick is that the inside of the lambda is not an unevaluated context. This is very important to remember. If you put any kind of anything um, into, these, into these curly braces, right, uh, you should, uh, it has to compile regardless of what you substitute, right? It has to be a valid substitution regardless. And that's because inside of these curly braces, you can put statements. And like, statements are dragons, I don't know. Um, no, it would have required us to do a lot more uh, work to have statement sphene. Um, and we'd already like rejected statement sphene at some point before. And so like concepts would be an additional feature that would have been harder to implement than just like syntactic sugar for enable if plus subsumption. So, um, you, so could, you, could you make the body of the lambda return true and just make the concept equal to the immediate invocation of the lambda with stood decalval of t. Um, with stood decalval of t, I don't know that you could do stood decalval of t. Oh, if it returns true and you're deducing stood decalval of t. Yes, I think that would probably work if it returns true. Yeah, that, that should work. That's even cuter. Um, Wow. Yeah, I, um, so to, to go through what Ben is suggesting there, um, instead of putting a requires here, right, because we are already introducing an unevaluated context with this other requires clause, right, um, we could just call this lambda. Um, he says that this should be a decalval here or something like that, which is, is another possibility, right? Um, we can actually also, if we want to have no arguments here, we can call this lambda by giving explicit template parameters to a lambda call operator. You have to do dot operator uh, parens with explicit template parameters, and then like open close parens. So you could like not even have this argument here, but if you wanted to not like sphene on the fact that something is copyable, then you could use the decalval for that also. But if you had the body return true, um, no, because that's not gonna, you would need it to be an overload set, right? Because you need to have a valid overload for the false case. If the thing can't be evaluated, what? No, because that's not, because the, the expression, the Boolean expression in a requires clause is not a, a Sphene safe context, to my knowledge. Um, the Boolean expression has to evaluate regardless of substitution. If you need something that, that um, does not necessarily evaluate regardless of substitution, you have to put it inside of requires, right? So if you need to create an unevaluated context and then you need a Boolean inside of that, you have to have an extra requires inside of the curly braces to make it into a Boolean concept check inside. Um, and like, I'm not explaining this well. I, I, if I had slightly more time, I'd probably pull up a Godbolt and type this live, but I'm nervous about doing that. Um, if there are no other questions, I will. But it looks like there's some questions online. Uh, there is one um, question, clarification question about slide 20. Slide 20. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad I put slide numbers on the slides at the last minute, because I usually don't do that. Um, so, uh, awesome. Clarification on slide 20. Yeah, the question is, why is uh, the class template TMPL also an ellipsis? 
why is the class template, the, the, the arguments for class template TMPL, right. So this has to match um, any template that's coming in here, right? Which means that the, the template template parameters to the, sorry, the template parameters to the template template that we're matching um, would have to be any number of them. If we gave a specific number of parameters here, like if we gave one, two, three, four, or if we gave like, you know, just one, then it wouldn't match a template um, that ha takes three uh, parameters, right? Um, so this, this needs to be generic over zero or more in order for us to be able to evaluate, have this be significant. Otherwise, we would be constraining the template in the pattern match sense to have a specific number of template parameters via this um, template template. I know I said template, like, 20 times in that answer. So if you want me to try and say it in a different way, um, did people follow that in the room at least, maybe? Like if you didn't follow it, um, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand. If you did follow it, did you, you wanna raise your hand? All right, that's actually fewer than I thought, so maybe I could try saying it again um, with different words. So template template parameters um, are, a, a kind of, of template parameter that has to match something in the expression, um, in the partial specialization expression, and it's not called an expression, somebody can correct me. I'm actually kind of curious what it is called. Um, but uh, this, so that means that this has to be, um, this symbol has to be a valid substitution of something here um, in terms of template parameters, right? And so there are, like, if we have one template parameter to the thing that we're matching here, then this is fine. But if I were to put, um, this, this is fine without the ellipsis, but if I were to put class, comma, class, comma, class, that wouldn't be a valid match, right? The, that would only match um, templates with three parameters, right? And so I would be, like, fixing the number of template parameters ahead of time. Uh, that could match this overload. Um, now, what I could do is if I had like an upper limit for the number that I wanted to accept, I could have one that's like, you know, takes one, one that takes three, one that takes five, one that takes seven, right? And then I wouldn't, they wouldn't, wouldn't need this requires clause. But that would be like really not that cute. Um, so, so in order to be generic over the number of template parameters that we match here, we have to have a, a variadic here. I hope that made sense. Template template parameters are like, they're not a dark corner of the language. There are like legitimate non-cute uses for these things. But they don't come up very often and so like they end up looking like they're a dark corner of the language, but they're not really that scary. Anyone else have questions? I have 12 seconds left. Awesome. Um, yeah, let's chat in the hallway if you saw, saw anything interesting. The slides are online if you want to see all the tricks I didn't talk about and want to ask me questions about them. I'm happy to answer questions on Twitter. I'm happy, let me put up all the places that I'll answer questions since my talk started a little late. I'll, t I'll answer questions on Twitter. I'll answer questions now in the hallway, in Discord. Thank you.